your spiritual well-being. Tonight we want to discuss some things concerning pressing on to spiritual maturity. What that means, what that looks like. If you're listening this evening by way of radio, we thank you for listening in. Our listening audience is quite large at times, and we fail to mention them so often, and I want to mention them this evening. If you're listening later, viewing later, by way of YouTube and the video channel that the church has there, we appreciate you tuning in as well and invite you to get your Bible and study along with us. Maturity does refer to the development at the end of a process of growth. The anticipation is that as physical or psychological growth is experienced, that spiritual growth will also take place. This anticipation is seen in the boy Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26. Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. We find a similar statement said about John the baptizer in Luke chapter 1 and verse 80. And the child continued to grow and become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Most Bible believers are familiar with the words about Jesus, maybe those found in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 40. As Luke there shares with us, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Maybe verse 52 will sound more familiar to you. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. This growth process was noted by one named Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 11 when he reviewed his life and said that when I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I used to think like a child. I used to reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. He matured. He went through a process of growth, and at the end of that process of growth, there was maturity. Spiritual maturity, then, is the development of godly character and godly behavior through a renewed mind and tested faith. Looking further at what Scripture has to say for spiritual maturity concerning Christians, we would have to note that spiritual maturity has Christ-likeness as the goal and the model. We are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Those who have received Christ are instructed in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, to walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and built up in Him, established in your faith. It's Christians who fix their eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Christ-likeness is the goal for spiritual maturity, but it's also the model for spiritual maturity. As this continues to be played out in many passages, we would find that spiritual maturity is marked by spiritual understanding. The church is instructed to not be children in thinking, rather in thinking be mature. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. It was a lack of spiritual maturity that brought that warning that we read about in Hebrews chapter 5 beginning in verse 12. And it actually goes on over into chapter 6. We'll get to it in just a few moments. But for the time's sake, we need to solidify what this spiritual maturity is that's marked by spiritual understanding. Spiritual maturity. 
If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 6, Paul had been writing previously uh, against human wisdom. But he quickly transitions to true Christian wisdom. And so he said, 1 Corinthians, 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. What does Paul mean by those who are mature? If you go over to chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, give us a clue as to the central meaning of this word that Paul uses, being mature. It's a dynamic term describing the maturity that is a product of Christian growth. Keeping this in mind then, the words that appear there in verse 2, spiritual men, as the New American Standard Bible has it, other translations have spiritual people, it may be rendered as people who trust firmly in Christ. Or in an idiomatic phraseology, it could be as people who have hearts high enough to recognize and understand spiritual truths. Spiritual maturity is marked by spiritual understanding. Spiritual maturity is manifest by discernment of God's will and changed behavior. Paul prayed for such discernment. He also prayed for the change. Colossians chapter 1, reading verses 9 and 10, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that, so the results would be that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul understood that discernment and change in the life of one who wants to be spiritually mature must occur. He instructed the Romans in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2 to be transformed by the renewing of their minds so that they would prove what the will of God is. But Paul also understood that there were those Christians, specifically those in Corinth, that were immature. And so he made a contrast between spiritual maturity and spiritual immaturity in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he said, that is, Paul wrote, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now... You are not able, for you are still fleshly. Spiritual maturity is the reason why one lays down the old self, one's former manner of living, which is being corrupted in accordance with the desires of the lust or the lust of deceit, as Ephesians 4 verse 22 says. The very next verse, Ephesians 4 and verse 23, states that spiritual maturity is choosing to be renewed in the spirit of the mind. Such renewal produces that fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. So spiritual maturity is manifest by one's ability to discern God's will and to change their behavior to be in accordance with it. Spiritual maturity is also marked by stability. Epaphras is noted as laboring earnestly in his prayers that the brethren in Colossae might stand firm or stand perfect. 
stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Colossians 4 and verse 12. As a result of this spiritual maturity, Paul would later write to the Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 that again, we are not to be tossed by here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. One who is able to withstand these schemes, this crafty plotting, is one who is stable in their faith, stable in their beliefs and practices. Stability in faith is a mark of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is also marked by care for the weaker brother. Now we who are strong ought to bear with the weaknesses of those without strength and not just to please ourselves. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 1. The mature are instructed in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Spiritual maturity is marked by one's care for the weaker Brethren, a Christian's aim is always toward spiritual maturity. This was Paul's aim in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. He said, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, mature, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Paul was always striving forward, always moving toward spiritual maturity. Jesus noted in the parable of the sower that some never moved to spiritual maturity from ver- for some very specific reasons. He named them to be the cares of this life. He named them to be the riches of this world and the pleasures of this life. He stated this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, Mark chapter 4, verse 19, Luke chapter 8, verse 14. But it's interesting to find that those same three things are used by Paul when he addresses one named Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Beginning the context in verse 3 and going through verse 10, he states some things that lead one away from God that lead one away from the spiritual maturity the Christian is aiming for. Specifically, beginning in verse 7 and going through verse 10, he names those same three things. Cares of this world, the gaining of riches, and the pleasures of this life. He makes that note before making this statement found in verse 11. But flee these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Christians aim for spiritual maturity. But they also must be aware that many things can keep them from going on to maturity. And that's why the Hebrew writer encourages Christians. The Hebrew writer encouraged some Christians to press on to maturity. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. It was specifically a group of Christians whom he had to write to that had become dull of hearing. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11. And they were in danger of drifting away from the Lord. Chapter 2 and verse 1. 
It's in this context that the spiritual maturity is discussed. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 11, concerning Him, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Moving then to chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore... Leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. Spiritual maturity, or spiritual immaturity, rather, almost always comes back to an improper diet. The diet of these Christians was milk when it should have been meat. The spiritual diet was milk because of what's stated there in verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. They were not accustomed to the word of righteousness. They were not accustomed to the word, and therefore meat could not be digested by them, and so they stayed with milk. But the warning as given by the New American Standard Bible is because he is an infant. The original language presents this phrase as being, for he has become a babe. He has become an infant. A Christian who stays only on the milk becomes an infant that stays immature. These Christians showed their immaturity by their lack of discernment and their contemplation of giving up Jesus and the Hebrew writer says, Whoa, wait just a moment. Wait just a moment. You go on. You press on to maturity. Let's not lay again the elementary principles. Let's not lay again the foundation. Let us move on. And then he instructs them how to do that. Like the Hebrew writer, though, preachers and teachers labor to help others to maturity. Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. I believe Paul said it best when he said, We proclaim Him, Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom so that we may present every man complete, mature in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. Spiritual maturity. The aim of every Christian, the purpose for which we preach and teach, is marked by discernment and an unshakable commitment. The ability to discern is a critical measure of spiritual maturity because babes are weak in discernment and they will accept any kind of spiritual food. However, the ones who have exercised their spiritual senses, that is, trained by practice and by habit, their discernment shows the difference between good and evil, and it presses on to maturity. Our spiritual maturity begins with you. I say our in the collective sense. Our spiritual maturity within this congregation begins with you. You specifically, the mature. Allow me quickly to tell you about some spiritual growth that has led to some spiritual maturity among our youth. Friends are coming, but they're not just every now and then. Friends are coming and they're coming regularly. These friends are getting involved. 
These friends are studying God's Word. The conversations which these young people are having show signs of spiritual growth. As their conversations are more reliant upon the Scriptures, the help and advice that they're giving to others is more scripturally based and more scripturally motivated. For spiritual growth to take place and for spiritual growth to continue to take place, one must take in God's Word in an appropriate diet level. What you see on the screens before you to illustrate this thought are some notes that were taken from Challenge Youth Conference. They were taken by our own Jamie Davis. But what's so interesting about this spiritual diet that was being fed to her about being unashamed is it seated not more than two seats from her was our own Anita Curtis. You see, spiritual maturity, spiritually mature Christians understand their need to influence the young. Young people and young Christians need the milk provided for them and fed to them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, it's noted that Paul, the more mature in the faith, was teaching and guiding the Christians at Corinth who were spiritually immature. Young Christians need the nurturing attention of mature Christians. Paul taught the basics. He used the first principles which he cut up and fed with great patience. And shame on us. Shame on us if we do not view the spiritually weak as a mission field. Shame on us if we do not reach out to young people to develop a relationship with them and then through that relationship to teach them the basics of the faith and teach them how to walk down the path that leads to spiritual maturity. Feeding non-believers, those who don't believe in God. Feeding non-Christians, those who believe but have not given their life to Christ. Feeding new converts, and even feeding the spiritually weak, is the responsibility of the spiritually mature who ought to be teachers. This spiritual feeding, though, is only part of the job. You see, the non-believer, the non-Christian, the new convert, the spiritually immature must take initiative to grow. Listen again to the words of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. He's become an infant because he's feasting solely on the milk of the Word. He hasn't taken the initiative to grow to spiritual maturity. If you were baptized 10, 20, 30 years ago or more, yet you're unskilled in the Word of God, shame on you. Shame on you. And when the Bible school has to suffer because of lack of teachers, shame on you, the spiritually aged who are yet spiritually immature. Notice with me the spiritual growth process as it takes place in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, we read verses 1 through 3. Therefore... Put aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. 
But where does this process begin? This is the end of the process. This is the end of the process as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word and go forth from the starting gate. It begins in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. As one is taught the gospel of Christ, that Christ bled and died on the cross. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. That His blood redeems us. 1 Peter 1, verse 19. That He was raised from the dead and given glory by God. 1 Peter 1 and verse 21. And this gives us hope for eternal life. Also 1 Peter 1, verse 21. This message of the gospel further teaches spiritual purity, obedience to God, and sincere love. 1 Peter 1 verse 22. The faith which has then been developed in the one being taught, the gospel, leads that one to act. And because he is led to act by his faith, 1 Peter 1 verse 23, he's born again. Born again by baptism that's further explained in Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. This same one who has committed his life to Christ, put Christ on in baptism, then chooses, 1 Peter 2 verse 1, to put away his former behavior, put away his former living. Thus, baptism marks the starting gate for the new infant in Christ who immediately is instructed to long for the pure spiritual milk that will help him to grow, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, those who are feasting on the spiritual milk are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. And it's at this point that the one who has given their life to Christ understands and feels the responsibility to teach others the very message to which they have obeyed. When God calls us to do something, He never will call us to do something beyond our ability. When God calls Christians to share the message with the lost, He's calling you to teach the very things you've been obedient to. Could it be that we fail to teach others because we don't know what exactly we committed ourselves to? Spiritually immature. But yet when the spiritually mature press on to maturity. The perpetual process leads to growth in all participants. Watch this. The babe in Christ on a diet of first principles is taught by the mature. The more mature who are pressing on to maturity get to revisit the first principles. But as they revisit those first principles, they're also able to add to them the more difficult meat of the scriptures and the scripturally or the spiritually rather mature who teaches yet still presses on to maturity can be reminded of just what it was like to wrestle with the first principles to wrestle with coming to an understanding of what God called them to do and so lest we forget where we came from, let us continually teach others the way to Christ. Here's the challenge laid before you. Become a Christian. Become a follower of Christ who is committed to having an active relationship with God through reading His Word, through praying, and through serving God because of your faith. Work towards spiritual maturity. If you can teach publicly, teach. If you can teach privately, teach. If you cannot teach, work towards being able to teach. 
Be in the Word often. Study at home. Study with us on Sunday morning. Study with us on Wednesday night in Bible class. Study with us in our worship. Study. Be in the Word to gain the knowledge of the Word. To grow accustomed to the Word. View non-believers, non-Christians, new converts, and the spiritually weak as a field to be harvested and then be a worker in the harvest. Furthermore, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into the harvest. That's what Jesus called us to do, Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. And allow God to give the increase. Allow God to cause the growth in you. Press on to spiritual maturity. And as you do so, then you can help others, teaching them to be spiritually mature. And allow God to cause the growth in you and the growth in those you teach. And finally, allow Him to cause the growth numerically. You see, in, first, in Philippians chapter 1, the first chapter of Philippians, verse number 6, it was out of the hands of Paul who planted and Apollos who watered. It was God who was giving the increase. God was giving the increase because Paul, who was mature in the faith, Apollos, who was mature in the faith, was committed to pressing on to maturity. They were committed to teaching others the gospel. And those whom they taught took the initiative to grow. And of those who took the initiative to grow, Spiritual growth took place as well as numerical growth. If you're ready tonight to make a commitment, to make the commitment to Christ to develop a lifelong relationship with God, a lifelong relationship of being committed to reading His Word, to understand what He wants you to know, a lifelong commitment to have a relationship with God through prayer so that you have a means to talk with Him. And you're willing to make a lifelong commitment to serve Him the rest of your life. Why not do it tonight? Make the commitment. If your relationship with God is not what it ought to be, choose to be restored. Choose to have the relationship with God that God wants you to have with Him. And then press on. Press on to maturity. Commit your life to Christ. Making the commitment to press on ever forward toward maturity. Tonight, if you, if you are subject to the Lord's invitation... He's calling you to a relationship with Him. A relationship of which He asks you to pursue maturity. And in those immature moments, those immature things we do, He's willing to forgive. He's willing to forget. If we will but commit ourselves to Him. If you need to do that at this very moment, we invite you as we stand and as we sing.